Yeah. Uh, so the overview of the hub team's work, um, we put some stuff in the agenda yesterday. Um, and I think Sean and Mattia, you guys can can give me share my screen here so we can all look at it. Um, you guys could give a overview of it. Um, so, um, yeah. Awesome. Uh, I can just talk on the first bullet point there. Uh, so there's a throttling mechanism that's a part of the ICS protocol right now uh, that we don't probably have to get super deep into, but it pretty much stops a, a jailing attack that's possible uh, on the provider. And so pretty much what uh, one thing our team's been working on lately is just uh, improvements to this throttling mechanism to make it uh, pretty much just less complex, use less states, and, and all that. And it's just a general improvement in efficiency as well. Uh, this will probably be targeted for some future release, maybe a couple months from now. Uh, but that's that's one thing. And then uh, besides that, there's been large efforts on our team of reviewing the LSM module, um, which has been some work from the Stride team uh, to get that into the specific branch of Cosmos SDK. They'll be referenced by uh, the ICS repo. Uh, so there's been kind of efforts from multiple people on the team. Uh, I think Mattia can probably talk a little bit more about that if he wants to. Yeah. I, I could also just add something to the throttling discussion. Um, sure, yeah. You're making it sound more boring than it is. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> uh, beyond there being efficiency improvements or whatever, it is uh, the throttling V2 is part of our push for uh, what we call untrusted consumer. So um, we don't want... Um, you know, right, right now, like, you know, consumer chains are consumer are malicious or malicious or malfunctioning consumer chain could cause, um, could cause some issues for the hub. Uh, the biggest one is that they could send a huge number of slash, uh, or the throttle will not slash because we don't have slashing anymore, but jailing packets at once. And basically see every validator was down essentially. And, um, they should all be jails. Uh, and so the throttling right now, that'll stop that. Um, it'll make it so that they don't all get jailed at once. They'll make it so it takes a while for them to all get jailed. Um, but that'll still be kind of an inconvenience during the time that's happening. Validators going to have to keep unjailing themselves and stuff. It's going to be a big, a big hullabaloo for everybody and a big pain in the ass. So, um, the throttling V2, what it does is it's just changing, um, the way the throttling works to make it so that instead of just the, 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 the jailing packets getting queued up, they actually just get bounced. Um, if there's been too many recently, they get bounced and then the consumer chain retries. Um, and so that's actually also simplifying a lot of the state, which is, which is a great, great added benefit, but, but that'll make it so if a consumer chain is going haywire and sending a bunch of jailing packets. It's really going to have very little effect on the hub. And as soon as it's noticed that that's, that's going on, validators will just halt that chain and then the entire thing will be over. So that'll be an improvement to the, the sort of, you know, uh, the security properties and get us closer to, um, yeah, untrust consumer. Yeah, there's there's a lot of current vulnerabilities that exist uh, if like a lot of packets were to be queued up on the provider, for example, um, and that state just becomes unbounded. So um, it just helps solve a lot of edge cases there, which is nice. So but the main value prop is just less queuing on the provider. Yeah. And that way we don't have to care. Like right now we still, it's kind of like, you, you know, in some ways, like the provider is pretty insulated from anything that might go wrong with consumers, but in other ways, like they can, if they go seriously haywire, it could mess, you know, it could be a big headache for everyone. Uh, we want to get to the point where the only question on whether to approve a consumer chain is like, you know, do we think this is going to make money or whatever? And, and not like having it to have, having the community having to like audit all the code, having to be like, well, that's, the consumer chain's business. So, yeah. Oh, uh, but yeah, let's move on to LSM stuff, I, I, I suppose. Yeah, I guess we, we already touched that. So we are uh, deep in review the last couple of weeks. Uh, on ICS side, most, well, I know that when I say it, it I'll immediately find something that doesn't work. So uh, I wrote most, Sorry. Uh, covered most of the, the cases for uh, interchain security, so we can establish that uh, there are no changes to the protocol. There are changes, right? Because uh, how you register a validator is a bit different. 
So we had to make those changes in the in the test to actually reflect that. I think now I'll just speak off the top of my head. I hope I'll not get blamed, but uh, I think we need a migration to up to migrate the state for the uh, with the addition of the LSM module because it changes how delegations are uh, handled. So that's probably a migration. Somebody can somebody can correct me and various other issues where what addresses we were discussing them. If you look at the pull request, I think it has now over 200. O'Reilly has a migration rate. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Riley, for, for, the, for the support. So there is a yeah. migration for it? Yeah, there's a migration. Oh, we just perfect. need to uh, put it into the relevant Gaia release. It's on the SDK right now. Cool. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, most most issues were were discussed. I think there are some things that are uh, above my head because I don't know, I don't really know inclusions uh, LSM modules. So there are some fixes listed by Zaki. As far as I can tell, they were either either fully or partially applied. But yeah, uh, the communication is, has been good. Uh, there's like two hundred threads on the on the or messages on the uh on the pull request that's the most that I've ever been in. So uh, I think it's doing great and it's getting closer. Uh nobody has anything about that. I can move on with the with the Yeah I I just want to discuss something that is relevant to the LSM. It's it's more of a release process thing. Um and that's actually something that maybe Denise from Haifa can also add something to but um we just also recently discussed this with with Riley. Um, the uh, it had been hoped that the LSM would go into V11, um, but V11 is now in the you know is, I think the release has been cut and it's in the early testing phases, um, and so um, LSM is not going to make it into V11, um, but it will make it into V12, and the LSM is going to be the only thing in V12, and. Um, the stride team had been concerned about that, um, which is understandable. And this relates to sort of our broader philosophy of trying to, at what we've been working towards all year, actually, of, of revamping the, the Gaia release process. Um, and in general, uh, in my experience, you, there's an anti-pattern that can arise with software releases where people, um, there may be a piece of software where the releases are infrequent. And so what happens is that people that want to get something into that release um, they will push to get it into the next release uh, and even delay the next release to get the thing in because they're like, well, who knows when the release after that's going to be, um, you know, maybe it'll be in a year, maybe it's going to be a year later. So we don't get into this one. We're never getting it in, you know, um, and this anti-pattern, I believe like, you know, some, some version of this had kind of existed with the hub um, in the, has in the past. Um, and so we're, we're pushing to, generally um increase the cadence of releases which we have been doing um this year been a lot more releases and then also part of that is making sure not to delay releases to get a specific feature in but to make releases frequent and low drama enough that if something misses a certain release it's not a big deal because the next release could happen very soon and so that relates to the lsm because it's um you know, as 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 we've been, you know, there's been a lot of discussion. There's a lot of people looking at, it, a lot of people reviewing it. Um, people from Occlusion, people from Cosmos SDK, people from our team, um, and it's we have a bunch of stuff that's in V11 and it's done and it's being tested, and so we're not going to delay V11 to get the LSM in. But that being said, we will be able to get the LSM to V V12, and um, the one constraint that we have, and V12 can come out very quickly. The one constraint we have is that we don't want to have two um releases up for voting at once on, on governance we don't we don't want to have upgrade proposal v11 and upgrade proposal v12 being voted on at the same time because we think that's just going to be confusing um so the only really hard uh I, I suppose like hard limiting to the the hard limit to the cadence of releases is is this two-week limit for voting because we don't want to have two things voted on at once that's it so um, as soon as the LSM stuff is done, all the teams have reviewed everything and everything's closed out, 
uh, we can basically immediately put it into V12, cut V12, uh, get it to Gaia for testing, um, and it can come up very quickly after that. And so I wanted to get your input on that, Denise. Like, I'm, I'm wondering um, if there's any sort of limits in terms of HIFA's bandwidth of like that could limit the frequency with, with which releases could be tested. Um, like how much overlap can there be? I, I assume, you know, you could certainly probably start testing a release when the previous release has not been released, but is in governance, right? Yeah, so Dante has automation set up that we can basically start testing whenever you guys publish a, um, the thing on a branch. Um, so as long as you tell us, like, here's the latest branch with the latest features, we want you to build off of this commit. Um, then Dante can point our automation towards that and start doing some exploratory testing as well. Mm -hmm. And then there's the test nets, which I guess is the next phase, right? So we'd want to, you probably don't want to have two release test nets going on at once, I'm guessing, right? Uh, because it's one yeah. test net that does all the releases, so. Yeah, I think that'd be non-ideal and that would probably confuse the validators. Yeah. So what is that, what is that cadence limit there? Is like, is it, is it the two weeks? Is it, is it, well, yeah, what is, was it two weeks or, or like, you know, how long does a release test net typically take to where you could then start the next release test net? you know, once it's done. Uh, in terms of like putting Gaia releases on a theta testnet, um, we're trying to limit, uh, we're trying to adhere to like the testnet Wednesday's cadence. So we want like mm -hmm. definitely at least a week between um, things. But if you, what kind of frequency are you looking to switch to? Like once a quarter? Well, uh, what we want to look at is like, let's say that, so we're, we're not putting LSM to V11 because V11 is like, you know, being tested now. But like, let's say that like, um, let's say that the LSM stuff's resolved tomorrow, you know, and it's missed V11, but it's like ready, like right away. We kind of want to explore like what's the minimum sort of, you know, delay that's going to happen if you missed a release, basically. And to me, it seems like two weeks because that's the limiting factor that's put into place by governance. But it seems like if V12 was done tomorrow, you could probably get it. Like, I think you're doing the release test net for V11, like what, like next week, right? Uh, well, next week we probably want to avoid. I don't think the LSM tomorrow. will be done tomorrow, but I'm just sort of wondering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, next week in particular is the Stride Mainnet launch, so I think we want to avoid doing testnet events on that particular day. But um, generally, I think depending on the complexity of the feature, two weeks sounds like a reasonable turnaround. Um, obviously, if Dante catches bugs, then there is like you know more lead time to go develop and fix the bugs and things like that. Yeah. So, so in general, the, the, the specifics, obviously, in this case or other cases, not necessarily always going to be the same. But in general, our goal is that if a feature misses a release but is almost ready, and then it's ready like the next day, hypothetically, uh, that like if you miss a release, the the penalty is two weeks. You know, so it's not a big deal. That's what we want to shoot for. You know, not that the penalty is like one year if you miss a release. You know, until the next one comes out. So, uh, so yeah, just wanted to check that that works for, from Haifa's perspective as well, but it seems like it does. Yeah. I think we could probably make that work. Cool. Well, that's what I wanted to say about that. Um, so I guess we can move on with, with some of the other work the team's been doing from, you know, Mattia and, and Sean, um, and we'll come back to Haifa as well, um, Denise, but that's in the next section there. Yeah. So. Continuing with the with the release stuff since I since I did it I'll I'll take this one. So we have successfully released release V3, uh, which uses 47. Uh, we caught some major major bugs with uh, with Haifa with Dante specifically when doing like the V testnet testing, and the bug we caught was like a very very subtle thing in uh, in how we send IBC packets over the wire. So there's actually no changes uh, in the code. It's just how you how you send stuff over the wires. So there was a very subtle change in uh, in proto enums in the Cosmos SDK in version 47, and there is a small like a very small nuance in how the proto files, not the proto files like the proto objects are uh, marshaled into JSON. So there was a very slight discrepancy between version 45 and 47. Uh, which wasn't state breaking, so we didn't catch it earlier. But luckily, we caught it uh, in test. So what we had to do is we had to make some we had we had to make some accommodations so that uh, the provider running forty five can process like the messages that it used to be used to processing 
and that the new consumer on 47 can send messages in either the new format, which is on 47, and in the old format, which the 45 provider can, can support. So the issue was uh, effectively fixed uh, with that. It, it was like a, a, really, a really big one, but it was something very, very small. Uh, yeah, so any questions on that? If no, I'll just keep rambling. Uh, yeah, so for the SDK 47 Gaia stuff that's ongoing, in the last couple of weeks, we actually managed to get all of our Gaia testing working. And now we are just making similar changes uh, to the ones that we had on uh, interchain security. How, how we like working and what we think is the best when you're working, like you should always have a working test suite so you can compare changes because it's easier to, it's easier to catch any breaking changes. So that's why we make all of our testing functional first and then move on to actually making the code changes. It's, it's worked for us. There are other approaches, but this is the one that we are usually taking. And for the untrusted consumer stuff, maybe Jahan, you can help me around this one. But I think we have a, we have a pull request on interchange security that is open for, I think it's for a light client attack scenario which ties into the untrusted consumer stuff right yeah actually i guess sean probably knows more about that than me um i, I think that uh, like i said the throttling v2 is part of the untrusted consumer but is there other stuff as well sean i think he might be talking about simon's pr mm -hmm. oh uh, which i think i don't actually have full context on to be honest I need to take a look at that, but I can, I, we've talked about this before in here. I can give a little context on what that's for. I, I don't, I, I probably need to review the PR to know exactly where that specific PR, you know, it's, it's going on with that. But basically, um, we're trying to get to the point where um, the, uh, you know, instances of double signing that happen on consumer chains can be, the evidence can be submitted directly to the Cosmos hub. Um, and so uh oh we have someone else joining there I just let them in um so yeah we want to get to the point where evidence double signing evidence can be submitted directly to the cosmos hub uh double signing and light client attack evidence which is as, as a whole is called equivocation evidence um and that's kind of the fundamental uh the fundamental thing we're trying to prevent with proof of stake um we want it to be that evidence to be submitted directly to the to the cosmos hub what happens right now is that evidence is submitted to the consumer chain the consumer chain sends a slash pack to the Cosmos hub. Then a governance proposal is created on the Cosmos hub to make sure that there's no like malicious slash packets. Um, we want to move to a thing where the evidence just goes straight to the Cosmos hub. And from there is cryptographically verified and there's no voting or anything like that. So um, that's what we're trying to do. And um, the PR in question, I, I, I believe, is what we've been working on, you know, what we've been working on um, recently on this, which is bringing... Is, is making it so that the Cosmos hub can verify um, light client attack evidence from consumer chains directly. Um, so yeah, I, I can't speak to it more than that because I haven't reviewed that PR yet. But, yeah. It's easier because uh, IBC already has all the machinery to evaluate light client attack evidence. Um, so we're kind of able to just call into the IBC library to do that. Uh, and then after we get that, um, then we'll be able to move on to working on um, the um, double signing evidence, which um, will require a, a little bit more custom code, I believe. Yeah, uh, and I believe that's that's the last two weeks. Yeah, I guess uh, there's also this uh, bug that showed up in the stride test net as well, right? Um, I can talk about that really quickly. So uh, in the test net, I think this was sometime last week, uh, we found that the stride chain uh, was halted due to the CCV channel being closed, which pretty much just means that the channel um, between the between guy, the provider, and stride was, was closed due to some uh, marshalling error. That happened and pretty much that should never show up uh in production that would be like a very bad scenario but luckily we we caught it in testnet and the issue arise from the fact that uh stride is running with sdk 47 and gaia is still on sdk 45 and 
uh, ideally you would have no changes in how uh, JSON is is uh, serialized uh, there. But due to kind of an issue with how things got into the SDK from our end, uh, there was a change in how things were marshaled. And so we fixed that and made things compatible. Um, and now we should be all good. And we've retested everything and the marshaling area doesn't show up. This kind of led to another conversation on like, how do we handle a closed CCB channel best? Uh, so if this worst case scenario happens and there's some sort of critical error in how things are actually sent over the wire uh, with interchange security, like how do we how do we actually recover from that? Or like, just what, what do you want to do there, right? Because in that scenario, the consumer chain is not necessarily uh, secured by the provider in the same way that it usually is. And so it's kind of the two options are, well, you can just halt the consumer or you can allow it to just run as a proof of authority chain until uh, until the, the dev teams are able to think of think of a good solution to whatever issue comes up and possibly you have the consumer on board again. And what we landed on, and uh, actually the release uh, will be out here in like half hour, but uh, Stride is going to go with the design that if this worst case scenario were to happen, they would just run as a proof of authority chain and the chain would not halt, which is probably a lot more desirable from a user perspective. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess, I think that seems to have covered probably our work. I was, uh, I guess we can move on to uh, Haifa then, Denise. Sure. Uh, so last two weeks, um, we've done a bunch of things on testnet. Uh, we did a stride rehearsal last Wednesday, um, went pretty smooth. We had a lot of validators uh, on board, which is cool. Um, so stride rehearsal two, I think is the name of it. Um, that now exists as a persistent chain on the replicated security test net. We're going to keep that around definitely at least until mainnet launch, um, maybe afterward as well, if people want to test on it. Um, if anyone is curious about any details around that, let me drop this forum post. Uh, Alexa wrote this forum post around um, kind of a play-by-play, -play, but just also reflections around mm -hmm. testnet events in general. Um, this is a practice that we're going to start doing to build more visibility around testnet Wednesdays and hopefully get uh, validators who are kind of on the edge, you know, standing on the edge of the room um, involved so, you know, they know what's happening. Um, we're doing a lot of ongoing uh, comms work uh, behind the scenes along with Milan and Abra to support the stride changeover for mainnet next week. Um, so all of us are kind of uh, in Discord fielding questions and making sure that Aiden and his team and Riley as well see all the questions that are inbound. Um, on the testing side, uh, it's kind of came up already, but in terms of the liquidity module removal, uh, Dante is currently working on some exploratory testing on whether the force withdrawal from pools works correctly. So that's kind of the focus of this week. Um, Elsewhere in the testnets program, uh, Alexa kicked off the testnet validator working group a couple weeks ago, I think two weeks ago. The initial members are Haifa and some of the folks from the replicated security testnet who have been super active over the last couple of months. Um, the point of this working group is to uh, improve kind of like bi-directional communication between the core teams and the testnet participa uh, participants. Um, so some of the things we're sort of looking at are redistributing Haifa stake on the testnet a little bit more meaningfully. Uh, last I checked, we still have about 57% of the total. So we're trying to get that number a little bit below 50% so that testnet looks a little bit more like mainnet. We can hopefully catch more issues that will happen in production um, if we can make the two environments look a little more similar. Um, we're also looking to increase participation on testnets. Uh, our hypothesis is that the testnet is a good place to obviously catch bugs before they go into production, but also as an educational piece for newer validators and folks on existing validate, validating teams who haven't you know, done as much operating as, uh, as much. Um, we're also looking to gather some feedback on testnet Wednesday. So uh, if anyone here has feedback um, or if you know someone who <laughs> wants to give feedback, please let us know, just send them to us. Uh, and this week we are drafting our Q3 OKRs, looking to set some goals for the next couple of months. Um, today, we launched uh, Duality again. Um, it was Duality's second rehearsal. Uh, it went pretty well, um, pretty much one hour from start to finish from uh, on-chain proposal until Relayer Up, which I think is pretty good. I think we're definitely decreasing the runtime of these events, which is great. Um, 
we ran into a couple of hiccups around the shape of the initial Genesis file, um, but a lot of people were online to help us resolve it. So that part went pretty well. We were going to upgrade Pi on one as well. Um, there was a Neutron emergency upgrade on mainnet a couple of weeks ago, and we were thinking of bringing testnet into sync with mainnet, but because duality ran a little bit later than we expected, um, the stop time for Neutron kind of came and went. So we're going to do Neutron a couple of weeks out after the Stride mainnet launch. Um, in terms of other upcoming and ongoing work, where uh, Dante is continuing to support the V11 upgrade testing work. Um, I think uh, he also worked with Riley and some folks with Stride to make sure that we have the right testing stories, um, getting some new automated uh, test, uh, test runs into our CI. Uh, and we're also working on a project to improve the reporting around past rehearsals. Um, so right now, look, if you've ever gone into our GitHub Actions repo, it's kind of a tangle. <laughs> it's just stuff everywhere. Um, so we're looking at building out some, just like a very simple web UI so that you can see, okay, given that we want to upgrade to V11, here's all the base versions that we tested. Here's all the, uh, you know, semantic version jump types, like my, ma major, minor patch. Um, so we'll hopefully have something demoable there in a couple of weeks time. Um, yeah, I think that's it for now unless anyone has questions or follow-ups. Could, could you go over the dashboard again? Sorry. Uh, yeah, so the dashboard is still uh, very much a work in progress, but the intention of the dashboard is to show um, almost like a report card. I know report card is kind of a loaded term in you know, anyone who has uh, <laughs> maybe like dreams about being in school still, but um, the idea being that we, have like a single view for every upgrade story. Um, so for example, going from V10 to V11, that's a major upgrade. Going from V110 to V11.1 would be a separate upgrade story. That's a minor upgrade within the V11 line. Um, so our hope is to have a top level report card that represents every unique combination of like version jump and upgrade type. And then within that, you can go and see all the um, sub tests that have been run, all the integration tests, all the uh, access all the failing um, error logs uh, and stuff like that. Okay, cool. Sounds awesome. Um, <clears throat> cool. So I guess the last thing we have on the agenda here is the V11 upgrade. Um, is this... Uh, yeah, just is this correct here? Are we going to be upgrading to the V4516 ICS LSM branch? Just that the correct branch name? Mattia or Sean, you might know more about this. Yeah, uh, not sure about the branch name now. It was that initially. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me check. Let me check. It's, uh, it's an easy check. That's the LSM one. That's going to be 12 now. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. I've had it open for the entire day. Now I can't find it. Yeah, that's the beam. Okay, anyway, um, <clears throat> what do we wanna discuss here with this V11 upgrade? Um, yeah, maybe we can give a status on exactly where it is in testing and stuff. And the release process. Uh, for the V11, for the hypo testing for V11? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't have a ton of details, actually. Uh, all I know is that it's happening. Um, let me look back at Udit's notes. Uh, let's see, V11. Um, we have all the, uh, all the new stories from Riley and the Stride team um, about new things we want to test. Uh, let me get back to you with some notes about that. I need to get some more details from Dante. Okay. 
Um, yeah, so I'm just wondering if, I, I guess we've gone through the agenda here. Um, we'd like people to add stuff that they want to discuss to the agenda. Um, people who are not uh, on the HIFA or informal teams. Um, I mean, will we add that stuff ourselves? So anyone can add it. Let me just make sure. Yeah, I think this is editable, editable by anybody. Um, so uh, yeah, I just want to make sure though, that if there is something that somebody wanted to discuss, but they did not add it to the agenda yet, um, that someone else on the call here, perhaps, um, just wondering if there's anything anybody wants to bring up or anything like that. If not, we'll, uh, we'll end the, we'll end the call. Um, and, uh, yeah. I suppose that's a, that's a no last chance to speak up. Um, other than that, um, I guess, uh, is there, is Isabel, is there any, is she still in here? Is there anything I'm forgetting about here that we're, that we're supposed to do? I think we've done covered everything. Um, yeah, I so, think we've covered everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, thanks for coming. Um, and, uh, we'll be making the recording available. Um, so yeah. Bye everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye.